I grew up in, in Fort Lee, so Fort Lee was just on the other side of the George Washington Bridge, so it was literally a mile and a half from New York City. Being the youngest in the family and being a boy and being a teenager at that time, you know, I kind of grew up in the late 60s, early 70s, was, or the beginning of my teenage years, and you know, I had the advantage of, of New York City as my playground, so I wasn't going into the family business or I wasn't going to law school, you know, I was looking for something else. And so, you know, photography kind of represented that for me. And then it was, well, where do I fit into this? Well, I'm not like really smart enough to be like, you know, a photojournalist or, or, or whatever. That wasn't my thing. And music was my thing. There was always that, that box of, um, of family snapshots that we'd pull out from time to time at family, um, I don't know, family occasions to look at things. It was always these odd shaped black and whites with deckel edges and the compositions were always off and it was always about wardrobe, it was always about lighting, it was very, they, they were older automobiles, they were things, props if you will, that, that, that I saw instantly as composition. At the same time I was always really interested in, in old black and white movies and, and especially like film noir and things like that. So I was very aware of lighting and I was very aware of those elements that, that kind of told a story. And so in that box was this family story. It was that history, but in each individual photograph, um, there was a story. Being a teenager and having the film Our East uh, happening and being able to go to those shows and you know tell my parents I was just going out with friends and end up in the city you know staying up till till six o'clock in the morning at a film or show you know listening to the to the Allman Brothers all night was pretty cool. Went into New York City and um, opened up a studio with um, with two friends of mine one from one from college and one from high school who were both photographers and we the three of us found a loft and did all the work ourselves and dumpster dived for, for an oven and for furniture and a counter and you know, whatever we needed to, to build out a loft and, uh, into a photo studio. We didn't know what we were doing. We just graduated uh, college. You know? So I was shooting bands. I was you know, doing that stuff traveling. I was doing the dog portraits. I was doing whatever it took to sort of find myself. And then I kind of came back to really who I am and what I was most interested in, which was sort of the music world and that sort of alternative, if you will, lifestyle that, that directed me a certain way. 1988, big year for me. I, I would say like 80 to 84 was sort of trying to find myself. You know, like 84, 85, it started to really click. Fast forward that as I'm in LA, I'm working for Rolling Stone and what was going on on the strip was this band. So they were happening. This was a happening moment of big hair bands and that kind of thing. And Rolling Stone asked me to shoot Guns N' Roses. So I knew about them. I was like, okay, cool. No one really knew what they were, but we knew they were those bad boys of the strip. And I did a random notes photograph. That was really a successful photograph. Still is to this day. We sell it in the gallery a lot. It's, it's, it's a big, um, it's a popular image of the band. And that was in 1988. Six months later, Appetite for Destruction just blew up like crazy and they were like the hottest thing of the moment. And so probably the first time for me anyway, within six month period, they went from almost obscurity to Rolling Stone cover. And that's what this shoot was about. So this was their Rolling Stone cover. So I shot them twice in that year, both for Rolling Stone. One was just showing who they were. The next one is them on the cover. There's the pictures you do for you and there's the pictures you do for the cover or the pictures you do for the client, you know, and it's always sort of that way. And so part of Rolling Stone, you're hired to go shoot a cover shoot, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee that your pictures are gonna make the cover, uh, whether they're not liked by the magazine or not liked by the subjects if they have control, or maybe it just didn't work, you know, maybe it just didn't get it, or we didn't get the opportunities. And so oftentimes it's, um, it's a crap shoot, and so you need to do something that you think will pop and will work on the cover, and you're getting a sense of, of the direction at that, of the moment, with, with the, the way the wind is blowing at the moment um, of covers, and in particular Rolling Stone. So it was always looking for some sort of hook, something that would, that would be a snappy cover, but also <laughs> have some integrity photographically for me, or creatively, as well as work for the magazine. So um, on that particular one, it was the Monsters of Rock tour. And so I had contact lenses made for all the band members, and they all had like a, one was red, one was like, like leopard um, pattern. They were all different. And I actually got these guys who had never put in contact lenses before to actually put them in for the shoot and do it. And of course today, you know, you, you pop it in with a, in two seconds in, a, in one move in a computer. But at the time it was kind of a big deal. And so I got them to look like monsters, you know, and to do some sort of crazy thing. And then obviously there's inside photos. So there's the cover that you do and then the inside photos. And there's Eddie Van Halen who, you know, growing up, along with, because I'm old enough, along with Eric Clapton being God, right? <laughs> a guitar God. 
Eddie Van Halen was also one of them. And someone I can relate to, he was young and energetic, and it was just, it was different. It wasn't, it wasn't Jimi Hendrix stratosphere or, or Eric Clapton stratosphere. It was accessible to me. It was of the moment. It wasn't, you know, someone who's passed and, um, and has become a legend and a god in a different way. So, but Eddie was fast and Eddie was good. And so I had this opportunity to shoot him and, um, for the inside. And um, I'm always looking for some hook, you know, and so it was about fire. And we thought about him, you know, how fast he played. That's what Eddie was about. And um, that he played so fast that he'd actually like set the neck on fire, you know, by, by moving his hands so quickly. And so I had a special effects friend and we, at the time, again, today, <clears throat> that whole shoot, you know, today, it wouldn't mean anything because you could do it all in post. I'd just shoot the guys for five minutes at a studio and then do everything in post. But at that moment, it was about doing it for real. And I wanted to do it for real. So we set his hands on fire. We had this protective gel that they use, that special effects guy, the stunt men use. And, um, and we set his hands on fire and I had him playing and did like a time exposure with him playing and, and flames coming off his hands. And then we'd blow it out and we'd light it up again. And, it was kind of, it was interesting. And then it was, of course, like, what am I doing? You know, it's like this guy, that he makes his living and I'm doing this and, and uh, here I am gonna, gonna challenge uh, um, his career by, uh, by setting his hands on fire. Again, in 1988, I did um, um, the New Jersey album cover, which was kind of a big deal for me. Jersey Boy, Jersey Shore, the, you know, the big hair band at that time, that point in my career, that year, it was, it was a big moment. That led to, um, this Rolling Stone cover shoot, I think a year or two later, or maybe it was even the same year, who knows, but it was, it was months later. And they were in England, um, in London, shooting, um, no, performing, pardon me. And so I went there um, with my team um, for Rolling Stone to shoot a cover. And I had like five days with them and we were going to the, the stadium every night to watch them perform and for sound check and I was shooting pictures backstage and I was shooting things along the way. And again, it's the Rolling Stone thing. It's, it's the cover that you've got to get the cover shot, whatever that is, which is a different way of shooting than what we, the freedom to shoot an inside picture. Um, so I'm shooting all week to get things, but I'm not getting the cover and I don't really know what that is. I'm sitting in my hotel room one night in London and I'm seeing a circus that's in town and they had this huge horse and it was jumping, rearing up. And I was like, wow, maybe put it in the studio behind John, that could be a great, behind the band, that could be a great cover shot. Um, wanted, dead or alive, I'm a steel horse. Yeah, you know, some, whatever, a, a hook, you know. And um, so I called up, this, I found the circus, I tracked him down and this guy was like, yeah, okay, great, we can do it. And I rented the studio in, in London and it was a rickety place and it was upstairs in a commercial building. It was like wood floors and this old wooden um, service elevator. And this horse was gigantic. And they had to tuck its head down so it would fit into the elevator and they bring it upstairs. And I'm like, okay, like get the horse to keep jumping. And the, guy, the band will say that the guy's like, no, the horse isn't gonna like jump for a hundred frames for you for a Rolling Stone cover. He's got like five jumps in him tops, you know? And I was like, okay. So I did a couple with the band and then I had the band step away and just did some with John and this horse was just rearing up and every time it came down, it, it would shake the building because it was such a big, heavy animal. I mean, it doesn't quite look into the picture because he was far enough behind John, but John was scared to death this thing was gonna come down on him. But, but you know, that's, that's one frame, that's the real deal and it was kind of fun and, and it was a moment and it became a really important Rolling Stone cover. Yeah, I've shot Metallica a number of times, but that was for Rolling Stone as well. And they were performing in um, Shaker Heights, Ohio, real suburban thing. And I'm like, what do I do, right? So I'm always looking for that, that, that strong environment to put them in. I was, I'm all about environment. So it's like find the environment, put the subjects in it, and light it right, and then make something happen. So it was those, those pieces, I had, to, I had to make that frame first. I had to make that, that landscape, that environment, then throw them in. I've got them in Shaker Heights, Ohio, and I'm like, what am I gonna do with this band? It's like, you know, I only got a couple of hours and I can't take them any place and it's boring suburbia. Now the truth is, I look back on it, like them sitting on the curb in suburbia or on a front stoop of some suburban house would have been crazy, would have been crazy good, but at the time I was looking for something that worked with them or something that was rock and roll. And so I just went to the Shaker Heights police station and, and I walked in and I was like, hey, I'm here from Rolling Stone. You know, I'm here, I'm shaved. I was like, hey, I'm here from Rolling Stone and I'm doing this band and, you know, can I use the jail? And they were like, yeah, okay. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, great. And set this whole thing up and I mean, I can't imagine what the band thought 
you know, when, when we finally hooked up, I was like, oh, come on, you know, I've got this location. And we went to the, to the local police station and I put them in this jail cell and lit it. And then I did, you know, had their mugshot um, panel, marquee, whatever it was, sign. You know, again, just set up something, told them to meet me in a bar that I'd found in Tribeca in, in Manhattan. And, and uh, you know, at two o'clock in the afternoon and he showed up and the bar was empty for the most part, maybe a couple of guys doing shots at the bar or something. And it was a pool table. And, just did pictures and him laying on the pool table and you know smoking a cigarette and just being Keith and that was really cool and then I was like come on let's let's take a walk and you know we were on the west side of Manhattan and it was the end of the day and the light was getting great and we started to take a walk and we're walking down the street um, and all of a sudden the police car pulls over and um, cops jump out and they you know they all want his, his autograph and you know sign my violation book and that creative access for me allowed me opportunities um, to really live out the kind of experiences that I want. I was in New York, it's 1988, also that year, um, and I'm shooting a uh, hip-hop artist by the name of Jazzo, and I was hired by the record company to do his album cover. And I, again, had a couple of gags, you know, a couple of props. That I, I think I had a, a black leopard that I'd, that I'd rented. And then this guy walks in, and I'm introduced to him, and it's Jay-Z, and I mean, he walked in, you know, with this <laughs> with this bling, you know, all this jewelry on the, all around him. And I was just like, who is this guy? But he was standing there on the shoot. And I was like, you know what, get in. Get in with, let me do some pictures of you two guys. And we did. And in fact, that ended up being, I, I believe, a single cover of the two of them together. Um, and then I, Jay-Z was just too interesting. And I was like, okay, you know, Jazzo, you go change or whatever. And <laughs> Jay, sit here. And I ended up shooting, you know, a few hundred pictures of, of, of Jay by himself. And then I forgot about it and moved on in my career. And really just a few years ago, um, I recognized, didn't I shoot Jay-Z? You know, as I was going through my archive and, and dug it up and said, these are freaking cool, especially given you know, who Jay is now. And, and so uh, printed up one, printed up this image and um, put it on the wall here in the gallery. And somebody called me up and said, Jay-Z just bought your picture and then and then my phone blew up all day from Rock Nation, from his company going, who, what, when, there. It, we, like, we both sort of forgot about it. And we both recognized that it's part of both of our legacies in some way. And he ended up licensing it for, for his album at the moment, and uh, of the moment. And, uh, and then somebody just told me recently that they saw it in his office, that it's hanging in his office. So, you know, it represents him at a certain part in, in his, you know, early part in his career in WA. It was interesting, um, that 1989, the next year, they had just broken uh, again. You know, I had a lot of opportunity like that. A big part of my career, I'll just say this, was not only opportunities to, to be there for the first um, iteration of a, of a band's success and their popularity, but also develop relationships where it carried on. And, and I had long-term opportunities over the years working with people. But in WA, um, it was for Esquire. And um, I'd heard, of, again, heard of the band, you know, sort of knew, knew as much as I could know about them at the time, but they were, they were breaking. And, um, you know, they were, they were bad boys. And so my thing was, well, it's real easy to, you know, hip hop already was in full swing, but real easy to take them to, to uh, you know, some urban graffitied wall that anybody can do. So I'm going to take on the Malibu, you know, and, and change it up. And so I told them to meet me at the Santa Monica Pier. And, and we all met. And uh, they had two cars and we had a van, my, my assistant's nine equipment. And I had an idea to take them down to Malibu. And they were willing at that time. I, I think, you know, it was before they sort of really copped an attitude and didn't um, and weren't willing as willing to to participate, collaborate in a photo shoot. It was more like just standing there for the most part. I mean, it all depends on the photographer, of course. But at that moment, they were willing to go with me and do and do what I wanted to do. And so I jumped in the car with, with Dre and I just said, drive down PCH and everybody else followed. And um, we went down to Malibu Beach and there's a fence and a drainage ditch there. And, um, you know, I'll never forget we got in the car and then, um, you know, Dre had this, had this pistol under the, under the seat that was the, you know, this, you know, big gat and I was just like, like I'm a Jersey kid, like that doesn't intimidate me. Let's just go do the shoot, let's have fun, you know. And, and uh, we drove down to the beach and got out and, and did some really great photos. They were all really still buds and were on the beach. And, you know, it, it was incongruous. It, just, it didn't, didn't seem to make sense. And there was just all these, um, you know, white kids and, and in bikinis. And, 
in NWA, and it just kind of felt like the right thing for me in some way. And um, we were shooting, and I had him like all posing for me on the beach, and then. Dre's phone rang, and you know, at that time it was 1989, so it was like this big sort of World War II walkie talkie cell phone, you know, and he picked it up and started talking. And so I stopped for a second, figuring, well, I'll wait till he looks back at me. And the other band members were still looking at me. They didn't know he was like on the phone and not looking at the camera, and they didn't really know I paused. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw this, this surfer walking into the frame, and, and I just clicked it at the right moment. And, and that became the picture. Talking about, you know, legends, um, you know, to have Iggy Pop and Debbie Harry together. This is later, obviously, in their careers. Um, but to have them together and um, uh, to have them together in the same room and, and just interacting and, and being able to grab it. It's, it's, I mean, this to me is not like what I could have done with them, maybe. Um, but it was a moment that I had with them. And, and again, from a life experience standpoint, the fact that I got to be with them and captured on film. Um, you know, it, it's also, it's, it's about, we talk about moments, you know. They've been photographed a lot over the course of their careers. There's a legacy here. There is a, a history. There is something that carries on forever in their lives and careers and in their image. And to have been um, a person who helped to document a chronicle that period of time um, through a moment which will carry on forever is, um, is kind of cool. Aretha, I've worked with Aretha a lot. She was so much fun. She was so, so Aretha, she was so, so the queen of soul. It was done her way. It was just done her way, you know. So I remember the first time I photographed her, I was hired by a magazine and I went to Detroit and uh, it was July and it was like, you know, 100 degrees in Detroit. The humidity was 100%. It was like fucking hot. I got this long hair and I've got a sport coat on, you know, and I like, and I came in and I, would, I was just sent to her address at her house and I, and I knock on the door and she never, she was not into air conditioning at all. You could not have air conditioning on because of her voice, ever. So that it was just a screen door and I knocked on the door in the suburban house and she answered the door in a bathing suit. And it was just like, oh, okay. And I walked in and she said, come on in, I'm cooking in the kitchen. And she was like cooking up something and she had clothes laid out everywhere. And there was a picture of her and everyone, everyone in the world that was important and her like on the wall. And I was just so enamored. I was a young pup, you know, in my career. And, and here I was with the great, Aretha Franklin, and she's looking to me to decide what clothes to wear for our, our shoot the next day. And I'd go, you know, and act really cool, like, yeah, I think this would be great, and this would be great. And meanwhile, I was just like, you know, full of butterflies and, and all that. And then anyway, so later on, we were shooting an album cover uh, as, 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 as time goes on. And uh, this was one of those places. I rented the Dodge Mansion in Detroit, and, and she comes out in this outfit, you know, they were all like showgirl kind of like outfits, this like yellow taffeta deal. And, and, um, and what do you do? You just go, okay, I mean, that's, that's freaking great, right? And, and she starts singing to me. And, you know, again, those moments that, that, I'll, that are really a part of my life experience, which is why I'm there. She had a tooth missing that day. And you could see it. So I went up to her and I was like, well, you, what are we going to do now? Obviously, we can retouch it. But she was like, don't you worry. You just go back to your camera. And she had some gum. And she kind of filled up the empty spot with her gum. And... She went on and when she passed, I was in a hotel room someplace. And it's, 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 I just remember being struck emotionally by it for some reason. And it's because of, you know, again, that life experience that I was lucky enough to have with someone who, who really um, changed the world in some way. Ray Charles, who I worked with many times. Um, you know, it, again, I have to just repeat, it's like having these opportunities to work with not only the legends of a lifetime, many lifetimes, um, but within my lifetime to have worked with these people who were still producing and, and who were so iconic um, meant so much to me. And to just walk in and, and to have a relationship with, with Ray because we'd worked together a number of times. And um, I had an assistant who used to make cassette tapes like at night um, so we'd always have fresh music on the set the next day, and we were shooting Ray this time, and he pulled together all this really obscure music of Ray's, and, and um, he played it, and, and Ray was like, oh, that's like so-and-so on the trumpet, or whatever, he was like, he was remembering back in like, you know, late 
40s, early 50s or whatever, this band that he was playing with, and that's what he was hearing in that obscure music, and, and it was really a, a cool moment. I mean, Ray, that's kind of Ray anyway, but it was definitely, this was a reaction to the music we were playing at the time, and even me remembering that is like a, a really special moment for me to remember that moment that happened, that, uh, that where all of the elements came together, the subject, the lighting, the, the music, the reaction, and then my decisive moment of pushing that shutter and connecting all those pieces together. That's, um, that's really an important part of the work that I do. So as I was uh, beginning of my career, and I'm working with Billy Joel a lot, and I start working with Bruce Springsteen and, and uh, Michael Bolton and different people, um, I'm coming out to LA all the time, and my travel agent, who is their travel agent, because that was her gig, was, was musicians and doing touring and that sort of thing, was like, you should stay at the Sunset Marquee. It's where everybody stays. You should be a part of that scene. And so I started staying at the Sunset Marquee, and um, it became my backdrop for photo shoots. I would shoot people here um, who were staying here and was here constantly. And so this became um, my home away from home and my place to party and my place to work. It's been a long time now. I mean, it's, it's a big part of my adult life that I've been connected to the Sunset Marquis Hotel. The Morrison Hotel Gallery, started by you know, my partners, um, Peter Botchley and Henry Diltz, also a photographer, famous photographer, and, um, and Rich Horowitz, um, had opened in New York City um, 21 years ago. And um, um, I was one of the early photographers um, in, the, in the gallery. And then as, as you know, time went on, I started getting more and more involved in bringing in other photographers, suggesting them, curating exhibitions, things like that, and becoming closer with my partners. And then they eventually asked me to become a partner in the gallery. And that coincided with a time in my life where I decided to leave New York and to move to LA. And um, this hotel, is, its DNA is about music and, and rock and roll, but it, the, the work doesn't reflect it. And I've got this gallery. Kick out who you've got here in the lobby. Let me take over that gallery. Let me put pictures all around the hotel and curate for the hotel and, and put our work around. Um, and I think it'll just really work. And that was eight years ago now. And um, it's become just this very important symbiotic relationship. Again, it has to do with the DNA, the pedigree of, of what this hotel is about and, and about the Sunset Strip, which is just up the block. And so the whole music scene and, and it just perfectly fits with what this gallery represents. We have a location in New York, one in here in Los Angeles, in West Hollywood, um, and in Maui. And in Maui, we're partnered with McFleetwood, who has a restaurant um, called Fleetwoods in a building um, in Lahaina. And um, we're on the first floor retail space, our gallery, and the restaurant is upstairs. And it's very similar to the Sunset Marquee in that this is a destination for music. It's why you come here. It's a part of, of, of the scene that you want to be a part of. Well, so is that restaurant. There's a, there's a stage on two different floors of the restaurant. It's a multi-storied uh, building. And on any given night, it could be Mick Fleetwood and Steven Tyler jamming with some band, or you know, the people that show up and what goes on there are kind of, it's kind of great. And so people show up there for that reason. And again, they come to the music scene and, and we're a part of that. So it, it just, um, you know, it's, it's what we've become. We've become associated with music. And so we're, we're so at home and connected here at the Sunset Marquee because of its past history and the same thing with Fleetwoods and, and what Mick Fleetwood and that, and that space represents. I've had these opportunities to shoot the legends that I grew up with in my life, the Aretha Franklins, the, the, the Ray Charles, the James Browns, the, the, the Bruce Springsteens, the, the, the Keith Richards, Mick Jagger. I mean, like, what the fuck? I'm just some kid from New Jersey. Like, how did this happen? Not only am I excited by it and, and full of butterflies and, and always on all of my shoots, but um, I actually am also confident with my career and the ability to get the pictures and do that. So it was less about the pictures or about, um, or about success as much as the success meant life experience for me. I'm really a lucky man and, and it's been really cool to not even think about it like I'm doing it or like it's a job because it's not. It's not what it was. It was, it was me just going off and doing what I do and always did. And the fact that I had the opportunity to do it with and collaborate with um, some of the most famous faces in pop culture history over the last 40 years is kind of cool. And the fact that I could do it at a certain level and do it the way I wanted to um, was really special.